Thank you, Gareth. And we also have an anniversary this week, a wedding anniversary. Is it tomorrow? 19 years, uh, Phil and Tara. So let's, let's hear it for, that, for their uh, big event tomorrow. You got a big day planned? <laughs> Always good to celebrate those times, isn't it? So people often ask me, in fact, I was asked this morning, how did you ever come to Bristol? Because uh, they noticed my Irish accent. I said, well, roost to blame. <laughs> You, you blame Phil, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's because of Ruth, because I met Ruth uh, while visiting Bristol many years ago, and uh, the rest is history, as they say. So how has your work, how, how has your week been? Good, bad, diff uh, difficult, indifferent, <laughs> just normal. I hope we've had a, um, a, good, a good week. Uh, and, you know, uh, so it's good to know that uh, no matter how we feel, no matter how we sort of come and approach uh, the Sunday service and weekend with, with the Lord, you know, our, our moods and our humors and our circumstances go up and down, don't they? But one thing is sure is that he remains the same. And his grace is the same. His grace is, is always there for us. And he's faithful. And his word is faithful. And that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. In James, uh, we're just continuing our series in the book of James. James chapter 2. And I'm going to read a few verses from verse 14. James chapter 2, verse 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? Or another translation says, what does it profit? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that, and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that said, that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Now, we've already realized that we can count on James to keep us straight, to give us a good challenge. And he won't let us down this morning. He's going to be challenging us uh, in our faith and challenging us in our Christian lives. And this subject is this morning that he's bringing to us is faith and deeds, the relationship between faith and good works. And there's three things I see in this uh, passage. First of all, the expression of true faith. Uh, claiming to have faith, James says, without a change in your life, without there being some outworking and evidence and something happening, is as useless as sentimental good wishes. Now, what is James saying here? Is he saying that if you're a true Christian, you're going to be out uh, doing the soup run every week and, and feeding the homeless? Well, they are obviously good things to do, and so many Christians get involved, many non-Christians get involved in, uh, in, in those uh, activities. But James is not saying uh, that. He's, he's taking this as an example, and he's saying that in the same way that if you just say to somebody who's cold, be warm, and don't help them to be warm, then you're, you're, you're just expressing idle words. And so... He, what is James is saying is that your faith, if you profess to be a Christian, there should be something happening. There should be a result. There should be something that people can observe that happens uh, as a result of your faith. Faith without action is dead. It's unproductive. It's sterile. 
Uh, but true faith is visit- visible and profitable. We see this right throughout the New Testament, not just um, in the book of James. Jesus himself said to his disciples, you are salt and light. A city that's built uh, on a hill cannot be hidden. You see, you don't hide your light under a bushel. He said, let your good, your, let your good works be seen by all, let your light so shine that your people may see your good works. What for? To glorify you? No. To glorify your Father who is in heaven. Because we are the children of our heavenly Father, he loves people, does good works, and blesses people, and, and, ble- and, and is good for others. So we, as children of God, also uh, follow in his footsteps. In Titus 3, 6 to 8, it says there, Titus writing to the Christians, he says, devote them, you, that they might devote yourself to doing what is good, excellent, and profitable. There's that word profitable again. Profitable simply means, in this, in this context, to accumulate. Now, I don't know if uh, you've ever been in business, but uh, if you're in business, the prime objective is to make a profit. Because if it costs you to, more than, than you earn, if, you, if you're paying out more than you're, that is coming in in business, then you're not in business. You're out of business. I have a friend who was a carpet layer, and he'd always dreamed all his life of having a shop. And so he, he rented a shop on the, on the Wells Road, a uh, very big shop. It had been a big wine merchant. Uh, and I thought to myself, because I did some electrical work for him there, I put some lights in. I thought, gosh, he's got to sell a lot of carpet <laughs> to pay the rent for this place. And I saw the rate, I saw the bills that he paid for rates. And sure enough, within a few months, uh, he was bankrupt. He was unable. So it was a great idea, but ill-conceived perhaps, and he, wasn't, he underestimated the, uh, overestimated the sales he could make, and so he had no profit, and so it was useless. Useless. That's what uh, Paul says here. What good is it? What profit? You see, becoming a Christian is about a change. It's about something happening. It's about uh, being better off and, and others around you being better off than you were before. Something happens and something changes. It's visible. It's profitable. First Peter, he says, such, live such good lives among the pagans that they may see your good works. Peter writes to Christians who are persecuted. And he's, he's writing to Christians who are hard-pressed. You know, some of them had their goods confiscated. Some of them were, per, uh, were, were chased from their homes. And yet, Peter says, how are you to respond? In kind? No, you're to respond with kindness and good works. And your good works will show people that there, that there is a change in your life, that you don't respond the same way as other people. You don't retaliate, but that something has changed in your life. Now, what about Paul? We're going to see a little bit further how James and Paul have sometimes been contrasted when it comes to faith and works. But Paul, even Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10, that famous passage, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. We know this well. But what about verse 10? He says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, to do the works that God has prepared in advance for us to do. So Paul puts it straight. He says, Hold on a minute. You're not saved by your good works. But after you're saved, after you're saved by grace, then there is some outcome, there is some follow-on, there is, there is something that happens that people can observe. In Northern Ireland, uh, there's been a big plague there of paramilitaries, and unfortunately that's still around, but back in the 70s, you know, they were at their height and at their peak. And the thing about a paramilitary organization, it's a bit like a gangster organization, you can join, but you can't leave. You can't leave. You're not allowed to say, oh, I've had enough now, I'm off. No. That's not allowed. But uh, there are many paramilitaries who were arrested, who were put in long cash in the prison. And uh, there, were, there were quite a, uh, dozens and dozens of them in there. And God moved in the hearts of some Christians to bring the gospel into that prison. 
And there was a, uh, there was a, they had an opportunity. They, they were able to hold some meetings, get some Bibles in. And, you know, God really moved in a, a wonderful way. And many of them, many paramilitaries came to know the Lord. Uh, and the paramilitary organizations, they, they must have met together and discussed it. And they decided that if someone was a true Christian, had really become a born again, true believer, then they would allow them to leave the movement because they could see that they were no, their heart was no longer in it. It was genuine. And so a person could say, I'm a, I'm a Christian. And they were allowed, when they got out of prison, not to be part of a paramilitary organization. But they were observed because there might have been those who would say, oh, well, this is my way out. I'm going to say I'm a Christian. They were closely monitored by the paramilitaries. Now, it, maybe it speaks about Christianity in Northern Ireland. It was more about what you don't do than what you do do. But it was, they, they said, you know, if, if, they, if they smoke, if they drink, if they womanize, if they're hanging out around bars, if, if they're not going to church, then we're going to say this is fake and we're going to hold you to account. There would be serious consequences. But you see, what I'm, what I'm getting at here is that there was, we might, but we know that we're saved by faith, but other people only see what they can see. They only see what they can observe. And people around us, if they're going to take note and know that we are Christians, then there has to be something that they can observe. That leads us on to the second point, the evidence of true faith. If you, it's a bit of a cliche, but if you were accused of being a Christian in a court of law, would there be enough evidence to convict you? That's a, a challenging one, isn't it? I told you James wasn't going to let us down. And he throws out a challenge and he says to people, prove it. Now, there must have been, if he says this, there must have been people who, who said this. There must have been people who said, I have faith, you have, you have faith, I have deeds. You see, we've understood that James is writing to uh, Christian communities, uh, mostly from a Jewish background. So they were people who knew the law. They were people who knew the Old Testament. And their uh, understanding was, if you keep God's law, then you'll be in good standing with God. You'll be fine. But now the message was coming that salvation is not through works. It's through faith in Jesus Christ. And so there may have been some who said, okay, well, I'm saved by faith. So what I do, it doesn't matter. Because I'm not saved by faith. I'm saved by grace. I'm saved by my faith. Uh, sorry, I'm not saved by works, but I'm saved by my faith in Christ. And I don't have to uh, do anything. I don't have to keep the law. I don't have to uh, have any result in my life. But James is going to challenge that head on. And he's going to say, some will say, you have faith, I have deeds. And he's going to say, show me your faith without your deeds. How are you going to do that? Show me your faith. But he says, I will show you my faith by what I do. He's not saying that I'm going to show you my good works. He's saying that I have faith. And as a result of faith, there is something that can be observed. There is something that is evident in my behavior. And he goes as far as saying even demons believe in God. But they have no good works to show for it, of course. You see, it's not enough to say you believe in God. It's not enough just with your mouth to say, I believe in God, even to come to church. I remember when I used to visit uh, churches from time to time. I visited this church once, and there was a, a, some beautiful plants over on the side of the stage, you know, and they were just decorating the, the stage there. And I just took note how, how pretty they're beautiful they were. And I came back the following year, and I looked at them, and they were just as pretty, but I noticed something about them was that they hadn't grown. They hadn't changed. So I went over to have a look, and sure enough, they were plastic. <laughs> I hope we're not, I'm not speaking this morning to someone who's a bit like that, who year after year doesn't have any growth, doesn't have any change. You see, everything that is alive is growing. Everything that is alive is, and the Bible says we are producing fruit. Fruit that will endure, fruit that will remain. The, 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 the fruit of God's work in you is that there's something that people can observe, that people can see, and people can uh, take note of. James is not saying that works are essential to faith, but that works are the evidence of faith. 
Now, uh, the third, so the expression of faith, the evidence of faith, the last one, examples of true faith. James is going to take uh, two examples, Abraham and Rahab. We had a, a message on Rahab uh, not so long ago by Marianne. And uh, you know about Abraham and his, his faith. And it's interesting because Paul also uses the story of Abraham. In Romans chapter 4, uh, in that passage, verse 1 to 5, you know, he, he, he speaks about the faith of Abraham. Uh, Paul is emphasizing that Abraham was saved by faith. Okay? Now, uh, here's a passage. Abraham believed God. It was credited to him as righteousness. You'll find that same quote in Romans. And he said that you see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of uh, a man called Martin Luther. Not Martin Luther King, but the original Martin Luther. Martin Luther was a Roman Catholic priest. He, were, he lived in Germany in the 1500s. And he was a man who was uh, sincerely troubled in himself because he wanted to be right with God. He wanted to know God, but he, he had no peace of mind. He had no assurance of his faith. He, he um, did good works. He practiced his religion, uh, which was Roman Catholicism. He was faithful to all that he could do, and, and he was very much committed to, uh, to faith and to, and to religion. <coughs> but he didn't have any assurance of faith. Until one day, as he was reading the book of Romans, he came across this verse, and it said, The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. And God revealed it to him by his Holy Spirit that salvation comes not by keeping all the commandments, not by keeping all the laws and regulations of the church, but it comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And he lived at a time when uh, people put a tremendous emphasis on good works. They believed in good works. They believed in also uh, buying indulgences. You know, that meant they gave money to have their sins uh, forgiven. And uh, Luther thought, no, this is wrong. This is all wrong. We shouldn't, that shouldn't be the way that we live. And so this was the beginning. And from there, he, he wrote uh, 95 theses, 95 uh, questions to be debated. And the rest is history. That was in 1517. And from that came what we call the Reformation. There was many, many people who realized that, faith, that salvation was not uh, in the gift of the church to give, but salvation was a gift of God by faith. And so James uh, Luther was very much uh, in favor of promoting and teaching the, the preeminence of faith, the necessity of faith. And Luther one day, he wrote, wrote, read this verse, you see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. Whoa, this stuck a little bit in his throat. In fact, he even uh, referred to James as a right strawy epistle, epistle of straw. And he couldn't, quite, he couldn't quite grasp the subtlety. You see, we're asked here to hold two truths at the same time. And if we can be mature enough and strong enough to, to understand that. Number one is, we are saved by faith alone. And number two is, faith never remains alone. Faith never remains alone. It never stops there. And so... Uh, Luther, he, he did actually in his works eventually come to an understanding and, 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 and digest uh, the book of James. But his, his preference that he loved the epistles of Paul, he loved Galatians, he loved Romans, and how Paul would preach. You see, James preached to uh, an audience, uh, his, his listeners were mostly from a Jewish background. They knew, they knew about the law. So he had to say to them, listen, you know, now that you're a Christian, you have to, there still has to be a fruit in your life. There has to be something happening. You can't just abandon uh, God's law. But uh, Paul, later on, he was faced with churches such as Corinthians. And the Corinthian church, there were ex-prostitutes. There were 
ex-murderers, there were sailors, rough people. There was the riffraff of the Mediterranean who lived in, in Corinth and who passed through Corinth. And, there, and, and he gives a, a, a description in one of his epistles uh, uh, of, of the type of people that, were, that made up the church. He says, and such were some of you. And he's and he, and he, he, he clear. And so it was important for Paul to emphasize the grace of God. The grace of God. Now, I looked through the epistle of James. The word grace does appear. Grace is in James. James has got it all. He's got the whole gospel. But he's putting the emphasis on what we do. Paul has got it all as well. Because we've already read that he believes in faith and he believes in works. But he's emphasizing faith. Can you hold those two? And see, God used different people in the scriptures to bring an emphasis. Just as today, you know, God will use you in a certain way. He'll use you to bring a certain emphasis and bring a certain uh, truth to people and a blessing to people. So Paul argued for the priority of faith. James argued for the proof of faith. And this is why they had to, uh, Luther and others following him, had to get that balance right. You see, sometimes perhaps I wonder, in the Protestant Reformation, did the pendulum swing a bit too far the other way, you know? And we say, right, oh, all you've got to do is believe. All you've got to do is be saved. And what, what about your life? What about afterwards? What about what comes from that? James is telling us that something should change. Something should come from it. Rahab showed her her priorities had changed. She trusted the God of Israel. She helped God's people. And so deeds are to faith what the body is to the spirit. He finishes the passage. What does it do? You see, if your body is there and your spirit, which is, lives in your body, if your spirit leaves your body, what happens? You die. You fall down dead. And we've heard, we've heard testimonies of people who had near-death experiences who saw themselves in the ceiling looking down at their bodies. And, 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 and well, you know, that's something we can't verify, but I can quite easily believe that that would be true. When the body separates from the spirit, when the spirit leaves the body, there is no life anymore. And so James is saying, listen, works are to faith what the spirit is to the body. It gives it legs. You see, your faith has to have some legs. It has to go somewhere. It has to be something that is used by God and that is seen. So in conclusion this morning, two things I want to uh, bring to you this morning to think about as our band comes back again. First of all, thank God for what has changed in your life. Do you remember what it was like before you were a Christian. Do you remember what was happening? Maybe you can look back on many years of Christian life and you can say, thank God that my, the, the direction of my life changed and, and I became a totally, I went in a different direction. God used me, God helped me. There's people among us this morning who've been faithful Christians in their church for years and years and years, been pillars in the church. And that's a precious thing. And we can give thanks to God for that. Maybe you, you're just a young Christian this morning and you're thinking, oh, oh, what about me? Well, your whole life is ahead of you. And you've got all this uh, time and energy to invest for the Lord. And so, as Paul exhorted us this morning, ask God, what are the works that he has planned for you? I'm excited this morning because I see this beautiful congregation. I see people who believe in Jesus. And I'm excited about the difference that you're going to make in your world. You see, whenever your faith is worked out, whenever you find that thing that God wants you to do, and maybe it's many things, whenever you find that purpose, see, it's not just those who are up the front uh, singing and preaching and, and doing things. God has something for all of us to do. It may be in church, it may be even outside of church. Something that God wants you to do. As a church, we want to get involved with our community. We, 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 may, we have our office still at the Vassal Center. And part of our vision in moving there is to partner with them to reach out to the local community here. And that's some, still something that we're praying about that we want to develop. And that we need people to step up and be able to help. In the church going forward, our church is growing. We need people to volunteer. 
We need people to be involved in the digital area, in the practical area, and set up in, in all in kids, in youth, in all kinds of areas. There's opportunity for you to serve. And maybe something else that God is calling you to do. But there will be an outcome. There has to be an outcome. There has to be an outworking of, what you're, of, what, of the faith that God has put in you. So thank God for what has changed in your life. And ask God, what are the works he has planned for you? I'm going to ask Gareth to come back and lead us in, the, in our response this morning to his word. Thank you.